Hi everyone, my name is Michael Johnson and I work in the Career Advising and Planning Office and I wanted to welcome you guys here to the Financial Services panel. Um, we're running a little bit behind so I want to make sure that there's time for you guys to ask questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have some questions that I can be asking, um, but we'll make sure that there's enough time, like I said at the end, for you guys to ask your questions. We'll go ahead and start by having the panel introduce themselves and we can start to my right over here with Larry and we'll go down and then I will pose a couple questions and hopefully the conversation will be very organic and um, we have a great conversation, so welcome. Thanks, I like the, the use of the word organic. Uh, but what's the use of the word integrate as in the calculus form in a report that I wrote and no one had used that probably in 10 years in equity research because you just don't need integration in equity research even though it could come in handy. Uh, my name is Larry Berlin, I did go to the University of Chicago. I am a BA in European history, I traded options and on the floor of the exchange, which barely exists anymore, and went back and got my MBA, and major concentrated in finance and other things, and went through a nice, fun career in life, including a lot of travel and all kinds of things like that, and then started working for First Analysis, where I can't believe it, I started just before the millennium. So I'm at 12 years now, I can't even do that math. And we do two, three things. One's corporate finance, which I do not do. The other two are equity research and venture capital. We're on our 13th venture fund. Um, every day you use one of our companies if you use your credit card. Um, you use our companies for other things. If you put gas in your car, one of our companies helped do the drilling and created the drill bit. So it's a huge variety of stuff that we do there. But I do follow, as we get to hear earlier, the credit card processing and financial information processing space is my home territory. And that's where I spend almost all of my day is researching, talking, learning, and investing in those spaces. And we'll let pass it on. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Flame. I am a alumnus of both the college, 2003, and Booth. I graduated in 2010. I'm an associate in the healthcare investment banking group of Robert W. Baird & Company here in Chicago. I was a Metcalf Fellow um, summer of 2002 in healthcare venture capital in Switzerland. Um, I spent went to investment banking, venture capital again, and then uh, Booth and Investment Banking. So I perhaps have one of the more traditional uh, backgrounds um, here and happy to answer any questions. Hi, my name is Eric Voskis. Uh, I graduated from the college in 2008. Um, I work at Bank of Montreal in the Investment Banking Group uh, covering the industrial space. I cover uh, metals, working with our metals and mining team and also the automotive sector. Um, <laughs> And this is covering mergers and acquisitions, debt, and equity products. Okay, I'm Paul Ellenbogen. I'm in the uh, institutional consulting group at Morningstar here in Chicago. Um, I graduated from the college. I'll date myself to 1986. Um, I took about a 10-year detour into the academic world, teaching government at the college level and earning a PhD in that subject, uh, and then went to work for Morningstar in the mid-'90s as a mutual fund analyst, um, then went from there to what is now known as DWS, the asset management arm of Deutsche Bank, uh, from there to an asset management firm in the western suburbs of Chicago known as Calamos, uh, and then back to Morningstar where my primary responsibility is working with uh, mutual fund, insurance company, retirement plan, boards, uh, basically any uh, fiduciary that oversees investments. Hi everyone, my name is Persis Alavia and I'm a 2005 graduate of the college, I had a degree in political science, and then I went to Credit Suisse uh, in New York, where I worked uh, also in metals and mining equity research. And I'm actually shocked that there's someone else um, on the panel because metals and mining is not always the hottest place to be. Um, I spent two years there uh, in New York, and then came back to Booth um, to do my MBA. And after my MBA, I went back to New York. Um, I'm now an American Express, and. Um, I started there um, doing a couple of product launches, and now I do business development, so I evaluate um, various acquisitions, uh, new products, partnerships, et cetera. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Morris, uh, 1986 graduate from the college, and I also have an MBA from what they now call the Booth School. Um, I've been in the financial markets most of my career, focusing on the derivative side. Um, currently, I'm working for a small proprietary trading firm uh, doing quantitative research and trading. 
Okay, so the first question everyone has is, I'm in school, I want experience. So what advice would you give someone who's maybe a second year looking to do an internship, but they don't have the experience on their resume? Um, what advice would you give them uh, to start that search? And once they get it, um, how would they succeed in that internship? I'll start on the left. Um, the, the, the important thing to, to gain when you're at that stage of your academic career is to gain useful skills. And it doesn't necessarily have to be focused specifically in the destination of the career that you want. You guys at this stage should be willing to take anything as long as you're, you're gaining skills, analytic skills, communication skills, computer skills. Those things are transferable to a real workplace um, uh, scenario. So you want to try to get populate your resume with things like that. Yeah, and then I would say, you know, to build off of that, um, don't be afraid to utilize the network that you have both at Chicago and, you know, through family and friends because um, I'm just flashing back to when I was a, a first and a second year um, and I got, I, I remember I had like three offers my second year and all of them came through um, working the personal connections and it put me in a much better place uh, my third year when um, other people just didn't have that type of work experience. And it can be kind of scary, cold calling, um, and I guess they call it cold emailing now, but <laughs> Uh, it, cold it's tweeting. cold tweeting, yeah. <laughs> um, it's totally worth it. And once you've done a couple, then you get over that initial sort of fear of it and you, you just become a pro at it. I'd, I'd follow up on that. Um, you know, cold calling is hard enough to make it a bit easier on yourself. Use the U of C network because, frankly, I'm more likely to respond to someone who has that connection, even if I've never met them, if they just are at, at Chicago. Um, that at least gives us something to start talking about. Um, I'd also say, at least at companies like ours, there aren't X internships which are filled. They're, it's kind of a variable thing. So uh, you may call someone, they may not have thought of having an intern, but you may be planting that idea in their mind and there may be a little pool of money. You're not terribly expensive uh, as an intern. So you know, just put, put in their mind some things you might be able to do and your willingness to do maybe the work a lot of work interns lined up doing is something that everybody agrees is really important to do, but no one wants to do themselves. So if you're kind of willing to raise your hand and say, I'll take a, tackle that project, that three-month thing that, that is either too tedious or, or just not interesting enough to sustain the permanent employees, then, then you're in. Also, uh, don't be afraid to use Google, especially if you're like a, a second year. I mean, it's very important to have something and you're not always you know there's only so many spots especially at the larger firms to where it may be worth your time to literally just google you know boutique investment bank chicago or whatever and then see what, where you know what you can dig up there's tons and tons of smaller you know whatever law firms banks consulting firms that would love to have a university of chicago guy there um for a summer working for free and uh you know and i'll just say not to scare you guys but uh i'm fairly active in the junior recruiting at, at uh, Bank of Montreal, and I can safely say that I would not have gotten a job coming out uh, when I was there. But that's not because of whatever is that bad. It's because I was unprepared. Um, I didn't do anything my second year, or uh, and really uh, my junior year was uh, I got lucky, and I got an internship at, at UBS being completely blind. Um, so you definitely have to be aggressive, get out there, and, uh, you know, like I said, keep working towards the general idea of the goal where you want to be. You don't have to know exactly what it is. It can be somewhere slightly adjacent, but just do something. I know that people have addressed, uh, the other panelists have addressed uh, summer experiences, but I am responsible for analyst recruiting at the University of Chicago for my firm. And as I look at potential intern candidates who are third years, I look at experiences such as blue chips um, and other types of clubs, other types of extracurricular activities where you can uh, you know, be building directly relevant financial analysis skills, uh, which are not incumbent upon you know, finding that dream internship. So I would definitely recommend that you explore those types of opportunities to begin to build literacy uh, in financial uh, topics, in financial analysis. Um, I think that will, when it comes to both help your resume stand out, and in terms of interviewing, I find that those types of uh, activities really set people apart. 
I would um, actually go back to uh, what Scott said and what the others said. Building skills is very important. But also, if you're coming out of your second year and you look at the world of finance, and there's 18 different career paths, and you don't know which one you want, the important thing is to use the opportunity to explore and to learn, not just to improve your skills, that's important, but you go to the University of Chicago, you know how to analyze, or you will. You know how to think. You, I think your skills, all of you, would be very useful to me in a lot of ways when you finish, but you need to know what you need to do. And it goes back to what you were saying. You've got to come out, and you can't spend your whole life and not know, you know, and end up in a marketing job and hate marketing. Now is a chance to find out if you like that marketing job or if you like that trading or if you like, you know, that investment banking. Go out, use the network, call us, email us, cold Facebook me. And, you know, ask, you're actually better off on LinkedIn. But, um, you know, go out and learn and figure it out so when you get to your third year, that internship begins to focus. And just figure you're at the bottom of the pyramid and you're working towards the top and that top may not happen until you're 65, but at least you're working towards it. <laughs> can, can I follow up on one thing that was mentioned here and talk about networking? Because there, there's a way to use the, the alumni and the alumni database, and there's a way not to. I think it's very important that if you guys reach out to an, an alumnus, um, that you do it in a way that you're trying to form a relationship. <coughs> Don't ask for a job. A lot of people say, you know, I tried the alumni database, it was worthless, no one responded to me because you don't connect your resume and say, hey, do you have any job op opportunities for me? What you need to do is part of your exploration for a career, and this is a perfect time for you guys in this room at your age and your, your, your level, to reach out to the alumni and say, hey, can I come by your office? Can we have a phone call? Can you tell me about what, you're do what you do? There, not only will you learn about a particular area and be able to focus your own career and also focus in your interviewing skills because you'll be able to speak the language, um, but you'll be able to form a relationship. And then you can follow up with them if it's something that you connect with, you know, somehow think of a, of a way to get your resume in front of them. Don't ask for a job, it will turn them off. I guess to follow up on that question, that's one way to effectively network. What are some other, I guess, mistakes that uh, students make um, when they're going about the job search or when they first start a position? What are some things that you could tell us uh, to help everyone kind of not make them? Start with the obvious. Um, I, you know, I have a teenager and a near teenager and I've almost given up on trying to get them to use real words and proper grammar within text. But when you're in a business situation, um, I told some of the students at Lance, we had a candidate in a second round of interviews who, who wrote, thanks, C-U-C-U-L-A-R. And this is somebody who spoke two languages on her way to an MBA and so forth and was immediately dropped. So just whatever you do personally, that's not my business. Just keep it professional when you're dealing with people. Don't say things like, hey, dude, which I've also <laughs> gotten from people. And that's maybe how they talk to their friends, fine. Uh, I'm not their parent to lecture them on that. It's just you, you drop yourself down a bunch of notches, um, some other obvious stuff, uh, you know, dress up, don't chew gum, uh, don't make any racially or ethnically insensitive remarks. These are all things that, that people have done and, and blown interviews, uh, surprisingly. I'd say know something about what you're going in for. If you're going to interview at, you know, American Express and with the credit card division, for example, know something about them. Don't just know that it's a blue logo. If you're coming to me and it's venture capital, know a little bit about venture capital if that's what your interest is. And just do, you know, use Google, use Wikipedia, do a little bit of research. And also if you can find anything about the person who's interviewing you and the company in specific. It's easy if it's a big company or if it's a small company and that is a great source as somebody else said for job search. Learn a little bit about them. And again, Wikipedia and things like that are just great for it. It's a lot easier to go to the rag and searching through a million books, <laughs> which we used to do. <laughs> That's actually uh, great advice because the, one of the biggest mistakes that I see uh, you guys make, and I made it at the same time, and I saw all my friends doing the same thing then, is you, you make your decision about where you're supposed to be before you know anything about, A, the position, the industry, or the adjacent industries. Um, a lot of you, you know, may think you have a pretty good idea of all oh, what you know the differences are between I know the three big ones are always investment banking research or sales and trading but it's so much bigger than that and I can tell you right now 
you really don't know as much as you think you do. Um, so before you walk into a room and try and convince someone else why you're perfect for you know equity research and why you were meant to do this, make sure you know what it is first. And and really, it doesn't just make you you know speak more eloquently and and uh, and more believable in your interview. You also aren't making a decision that uh, is wrong for you, right? Just be honest with yourself. Uh, learn as much as you can. Use use us. You, you know, use the network. Send emails. Hear it straight from the horse's mouth. What they do what is different about their job or their company, and then make the educated decision. Is this right for me? Is this where I want to be going? Yeah, and then I, I would follow up with that. Um, there's some very like basic etiquette that, um, so, so we just finished up MBA recruiting at American Express, and I can tell you that the reason that some people didn't get interviews, um, two people um, never send a thank you note to anyone that they talked to, and when you have someone who did send thank you notes, and that's, pretty much the only difference, it makes it really easy for us to say, okay, let's give the interview to this person. Um, another person never followed up on um, any of the other names that we gave them. Uh, so if you're lucky enough to get um, time to talk with someone and they say you should talk to these three other people and you don't, like, trust me, they'll find out and you just won't have, um, your reputation will be a little damaged at that point. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is, is be on time. I know it sounds really mm -hmm. simple, but Maybe it's because now we just like text all the time, like I'm going to be late and communication has become really informal. But for interviews and informationals and mock interviews, um, being late is a really easy way to distinguish um, yourself and not in a good way. So um, just having some of that and also a degree of humility, because I think what, Eric, what, what you were saying, you just, right? Uh, maybe. Um, you you know, you don't really know that much when you go in, and especially if you're talking to someone who's really senior, um, you just have to remember, like, you're there to learn and um, to kind of check the, the attitude and the ego at the door. I mean, those, those are great points. And what they're highlighting is the f two things. First of all, um, perceptions, first impressions are very important. Also, think about um, the other side. Um, she has, what, 50, 100 people to talk to, she has to narrow it down to a small percent of that, okay? Is she thinking about, gee, I really like this person, I really want to like this person, I really want to like this person? No. She's thinking about, how, who can I get rid of? How can I take this problem, which is here, and make it manageable? And she just gave you three or four examples of how people made it easier for her. Um, they, didn't, they didn't write thank you notes. Well, phew, I don't have to worry about this person. Because this person is saying to her, I'm not really interested, right? Um, and she's got already uh, 200 times the amount of spots that she can mm -hmm. fill of people that are interested. So those little small things and first impressions, um, you know, if you're not wearing socks, I'm going to notice it. <laughs> um, I'm going to notice all these little things because I'm creating a model of you from whatever little data I have and if I see something like that, you know, um, I, I'm going to remember it, and it's going to put you in that column where I'm going to say, okay, let's see if I can get rid of this person so I can focus on the more important things. So, so you might, it's, not, it's completely non-University of Chicago. Why should anybody care, you know, the way I look? It's what's inside, right? The, the true me will come out if, if I get a chance. But that's not how it works because um, people don't have the time um, and it's human nature. Human nature is to one, to make a snap judgment based on the information that you s see in front of you, and two, to, write, to try to confirm that. Um, and so if you start on the wrong foot, you're just going to go downhill. Yeah, and along those lines, um, you want to keep in mind that you're always on. You might think, well, I'm going to go to this interview and then I'm going to walk out of there and just start chatting. Um, I work at a company that has no walls around offices and a kind of informal dress code. You don't know who's listening to what you're saying. They could be the CEO of the company. You don't know if it's a key decision maker that you would meet the next time you interview if you get through it, but you said something you know, offhand about the person you interviewed with. So just, just treat it as uh, you're kind of like a politician. The mic is always on, even when you think it's off. You guys touched upon um, the University of Chicago and its culture and um, what students kind of go through. Looking back, can you complete this question? If I knew then what I know now, I would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Larry, you should start that one. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to think of what's appropriate there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're related to getting a job. That's the. Uh... You know, um, I don't know if there's a good. I, I, for me, I don't know if there is a good answer for that. What I learned at the University of Chicago is how to think and how to analyze, and how to better use that would probably be. You know, I wish I'd known that. I wish I'd known how important that was. I also wish I'd known how important it was to, everyone's talking about connections and networking. I got my job because of curling. I mean, I throw stones on ice. It's knowing people and caring about them and looking at them in the eyes and being able to put people together in situations. If I'd known that a long time ago, it probably would have helped, but I am in the career I want, so I've done pretty good. I might be a history major if I'd known now what I knew then. <laughs> or not a, I was a history major, I might be an historian. <laughs> Um, the piece of perhaps more concrete advice I would say is that you have to start early. Uh, looking for a job is a full-time job. Um, what I tell people who are applying to business school, applying to business school is a full-time job. Uh, I know, you know the University of Chicago is incredibly demanding when it comes to your academic studies, but you have to be willing to you know, invest the time um, on the side to, uh, you know, to find <coughs> the career you're looking for. Um, as the other panelists have said, it, you have to do an incredible amount of research trying to differentiate between investment banking and equity research and sales and trading and whatnot. And the only way you can honestly stay ahead of your peers and, frankly, your competitors from other schools is to start early and work on it uh, really every day. Um, you're trying to accumulate a, a huge amount of knowledge and synthesize that and be able to speak intelligently about the industry when you, you know, meet with one of us or you meet with, uh, you know, other individuals. And um, the only way you can do that is to start now. What I didn't do is I started way too late. I ended up being very lucky. I think luck plays a big role in it, in finding the inter internship that I did, but uh, which then set me on my career path. But um, if I, you know, knew now what I, if I knew then what I do now, it would be to start much earlier in in all of my research and job search. Uh, if I knew then what I knew now, first off, uh, I definitely would have started earlier. Um, I actually didn't even go to taking the next step, and you know, now, like I said, I, I can't believe that I didn't because this is such a great resource to have. But the the other thing is that uh, I mean, I would have spent a lot more time learning how the world works. I mean, we work with, uh, or, or rather, our industry touches with everyone else in, in these other uh, panel discussions and rooms. I mean, they all are involved in one way or another. And uh, not knowing how it all works, how on earth can you possibly, you know, figure out where you want to be or where, you know, where you belong? Um, you know, if you're interested in business, it doesn't necessarily mean that it should be the financial side, not to discourage you, but, you know, there's, there's operations side, there's investing side, there's advisory side, there's maybe you want to be the lawyer involved, you know, advising, maybe you want to be the consultant. There's, there's some, not that law, finance, and consulting are the only places you can go, you know, maybe you want to be, uh, you know, a professor in school. There's so many different uh, areas which all touch around the same, uh, same whatever core, and uh, really spending a little bit of extra time figuring out how it all works, how they, you know, how they interact with one another, and hearing it from the people that do it every day, will help you that much more in finding out where you belong, and will actually help you target your focus and in increasing your probability of. Uh, of someone else seeing that you're the right man for the job because you know what you already did their job for them and you figured it out yourself this is where I belong so um, I would say uh, don't underestimate your writing abilities as a kind of competitive advantage you have over people at other schools uh, you know we interview a lot of people and it's surprising how many people can't write I don't just mean the, no. the notes and things that they should write but they can't put a coherent argument together. And, and one of the things I hope is still true at Chicago is that whatever your major, you can, you can put together a coherent argument and present it. Um, so along those lines, uh, I guess you, you also, uh, or, or a thing I would have done differently is get used to working with other people. Uh, I think the, the U of C model is kind of the lone philosophic analytic type sitting in a corner coming up with great ideas. And, Business requires interaction with other people, including, let's not say this too loudly, people not as smart as you. And um, so you, you want to try to subtly show that you can do that, that, that you can kind of speak the language. In my case, it's, you, know, you don't just speak to the rocket scientists in our business, the quants, but that you can actually speak to individual, 
excuse me, individual investors who don't have the benefit of a USC education. Th those may be your customers too. So uh, kind of coming off the pedestal and showing that you can work with all kinds of people is, is probably good practice to have and good thing to talk about in an interview. I would just say that I, I wish I had been a little more uh, well-informed and a little more thoughtful about my career decisions. I don't regret any of them. They were really um, important milestones along the way, and I'm still still very early on in my career, so I have, you know, hearing comments um, from some of the more seasoned members of the panel is, is very helpful. You can say old. It's just... You know, I think we were chatting at the lunch round table today, and the comment I made was, "If you let's say you want to be a banker or a trader, um, but you know you pick up the Wall Street Journal and nothing interests you um, in anything, maybe maybe not even the money and investing section. Um, maybe you should look at something that actually interests you, um, and that's you know that's sort of where I am right now. Is trying to find something that I'm really passionate about because if you're not passionate about, it, you're just you're not going to be." good at it, no matter how much like money or prestige they would throw at you. So um, thinking about it now, not too bad. <laughs> yeah, thinking back to when uh, I was your age, um, I don't remember too much from back then, but um, I, was, I was so afraid to talk to older people. I was so afraid I was going to say something stupid and, you know, that, you know, I would, it would scar me for life. I would avoid, um, you know, contact. I was so stupid. I mean, we're giving you examples here of why that's what you don't want to do, but I can, I can say it passionately because it's exactly how I was. Um, I lost so many opportunities to, to sort of define my career path and, and also um, learn about things because I was just, you know, I wouldn't follow up. I was, I was afraid. I was physically afraid to, to, to speak to older people. And l let me just tell you, and I, I've told some of you this before, um, when you get to be my age, you don't remember anything anyway. So don't worry about if you say something stupid to me or anybody else up here, you don't have to worry about that because we're not going to say, oh, yeah, that was the guy. I remember him. He was sitting in the third row and he had on that. We're not going to remember that. So don't worry about it. Just be, be, be yourself and don't be afraid to go out there and, um, and, um, and learn. I want to add something to what Persis just said. Being interested is huge. When, and it's huge in your preparation. And it goes back to your first question, Michael. Being interested in what you're doing is so important. If you, if I ask you a question, I talked with a young lady earlier who was a French literature major. I don't know if she's sitting here or not. But that was fantastic because she showed how she could analyze and how she could think based upon the French literature. And yes, I'm thinking about analyzing stocks, but that interest shows through. If you pick up the Wall Street Journal and you hate everything in it and you go in for an interview with me and you're not interested in Section C or Section B or Section A or anything else, you probably should be interviewing in a different sector and in one of the other rooms here. So being interested is important in your prep. It's important in your interview. And it's going to be important towards you enjoying your life and your career. Talking about some of the classes that you took, is there one professor or class that really kind of changed your perception or uh, how you viewed the world or one that you kind of use to this day, whether it's corporate finance or philosophy or something like that? Emmett Larkin. He was mentioned during our lunch. Um, one day, he, he, two things he said to me that were very, I think, wise. One, he said, when I go to a restaurant, I want to have a soup, and then a salad, and then a main meal, and then cheese, and then dessert. He eats very well. I don't want stew. What you're giving me, sir, is stew. He taught me how to write, because I was writing stew. And as everybody said, writing is so important, and so many people come to me who can't write. The next thing he said to me was probably 10 years later, and he looked at me and said, Mr. Berlin, you're now about 29 years old and you're feeling lost because all your friends have careers and you don't. You're just hitting the age where you can make a decision on what to do for the rest of your life. Be patient. And Mr. Larkin was an amazing influence on me. And he's still around, I believe. <laughs> uh, I'll mention Ralph Lerner, who I believe is now an emeritus professor uh, um, at the school. And um, uh, one of the things he taught was to keep in mind the big picture. Sometimes as I'm asked by friends, you know, how could this financial crisis have happened? You know, didn't people have these very exact models of risk and mortgages and default rates and collateralized obligations and so forth? And I said, yes, they did. But what was lacking is somebody who could look at the spreadsheet and say, 
that number may be accurate, but, but what about your assumption here? Aren't you assuming that housing prices will continue to go up forever? And, and it turns out some of these models were, but nobody asked that kind of question. They just said, well, how do you get to this, this equation in this cell? And okay, with those inputs, you get to that output and it all makes sense. The kind of big picture questions that I think you're trained to ask at the University of Chicago, often very simple, uh, are the kind of questions that people didn't ask. And you, know, you could say that's, that's the cause of the whole crisis. Nobody asked the obvious, simple, basic, high-level questions. Um, so try those if you have a professor who taught you to do that. Uh, I don't remember. See, I, see, I can't even remember the professor's name. Uh, what's the guy that teaches entrepreneurship? The guy, the car Steve guy. Steve Kaplan. No, 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 no. The Paul Gompers. Scott Meadows. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great guy. Uh, no, I, I would say. <laughs> I've had them all. All of them. None of those. But anyway, um, that doesn't matter. Um, the, the, I guess. Uh, there, there's a lot, I mean, it's the liberal arts education, really, I, I guess when it comes down to it. I mean, I was fascinated with every new thing that I learned, statistics, um, psychology, history, philosophy, economics, just the, the, the mix of them. I, I encourage everybody to really embrace the liberal arts education and, 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 and take as many weird stuff as you can because in the end, it's, it's the things that you really might not have were sort of off the beaten path of what your main focus was that as, as you grow in your career and your life, you use all that stuff and having that, that base really helps. So I would echo that in that insofar as I can't off the top of my head name any of my professors from the college, but the Thank the, you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm quite close to it, so um, the the single course though I would say which I use every day from business school, I don't necessarily use corporate finance every day, I don't necessarily use accounting every day. The single course I use every day I took in business school, it was a psychology course called Power and Influence in Organizations. Yeah. It's about how do I uh, communicate with others, how do I uh, bring others to view an issue the way I do, how do I convince them, how do I, and there's actually quite a lot of academic research about this which I was totally unaware of, and I literally every day think about, okay, I want to reach out to this person. I want to get them to you know, respond. Maybe it's an alumnus from the business school and I want to draw a, a new connection to my network. Um, maybe it's one of my colleagues. Maybe it's somebody in a different division of my firm that I want to, to meet. How do I do that? And I basically draw upon these, these precepts all the time. I know that um, you as students have a, a limited ability to take some booth courses. Um, but honestly, the psychology of interacting with humans, with other individuals, I think is one of the most interesting things that happens in the workplace, not necessarily the, the hard functional skills of finance or accounting. Um, and every day, I use that course. Schrager. Professor Schrager. James Schrager. Okay. James Schrager. That's what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> if you get a chance uh, to take his entrepreneurial class, he is so insightful about business and asking those questions, those right questions, really, really opened my mind up to a lot of different things. Yeah, so his class is New Venture Strategy, and it's excellent. Um, I don't know if that's open for um, undergrads, but I will say that building the new venture with Waverly Deutsch um, was uh, my along with um, Schrager's class were my top two favorite ones. And the reason is, is because in that class we actually did things. You came up with a business idea, you wrote the plan, you, she gave you scenarios like how would, what would you do if this happened or if you had a PR nightmare or something. And in really every day, like you, I remember like little parts of that class, not I'm sure subconsciously I remember them, but it was pretty much like any time that you don't want to do something, she made you do it. And having her push you along really helps you just push yourself. So uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't recall too much from class from my experience, even though I'm actually the closest to it out of anyone here. But uh, one of the main things that I took from my University of Chicago experience that I use every day and I feel like has benefited me immensely is my involvement in, uh, in my fraternity. And it doesn't necessarily be fraternity, it be any organization that you're a part of. Um, if you see that something needs to be done, and this is something that I was doing then, and you know, no one else is doing it, I mean, just suck it up and do it and you know, do a good job at it. One of the things that I feel like has set me apart um, at my current employer is that I take opportunities. When they show up, I do it. And you know what? If I do a good job and someone notices that, then they're gonna give me something else. And the opportunities start to you know, 
roll up and they start to you know build up and amount. And the next thing you know, you're working with people that you know you never thought you'd work with, right? Like, and and really that is, uh, in in my opinion, the the best way to set yourself apart is you know something needs to be done. Just do it and uh, give it your best shot. Say so read closely too, which is something I was called on more than once. I was sort of mouthing off, and some professors said, "You know, Mr. Ellen Bogan, if you look at page 27, it clearly contradicts what you just said." And of course, I. Oh yeah, okay. Um, I mean, we we bought uh, Morningstar bought an entire business called Footnoted, and and the nature there the whole nature of their business is to read company statements for the sort of things that, all due respect, lawyers bury in footnotes. And so you would find things like the CEO's wife is entitled to $6 million for a decoration of their doghouse. And um, <laughs> you, you start to notice those things and you realize, well, this company, the financials look very good at the kind of top level, but something's going on here if people are enjoying these kinds of perks. and money is being diverted for things that really aren't critical to the functioning of the business. And so you can, you can make a living, in a sense, out of reading things very, very carefully, more carefully than everybody else who's probably just blowing through the footnotes, which you've been trained not to do, of course. You know, that's where the real stuff is. Okay, the last question, and then we'll open it up so anybody who wants to, when the panel is done, come up to the microphone. Um, the last question is, the industry's been through some turmoil over the past couple of years. What, do you, what advice do you have to students who will be entering the workforce um, in the next couple of years? What do you think they might be expecting or should expect? Have a broad net. You gotta try a lot of different things, and have different options available because it's still a pretty tough economy out there. Um, and uh, I don't foresee it. It's going to get a little better, but I, I don't think it's going to be great um, by the time you guys, maybe the 2014 guys, maybe, maybe. But um, it's still pretty tough out there. So you gotta, you got to take the advice of the people up here and you really got to get out there and make it happen. I mean, you, um, you guys are pretty coddled in your life and you have people doing things for, for you and your life is pretty structured, but this is something you guys got to go out and, and do yourselves and make it happen. Yeah, I'd echo that. Um, I'd have a couple of different plans, like let's say you're on the banking track and it just doesn't work out. Like You should have some other ideas for what you want to do and then you should approach them as sort of excitedly as you would have maybe your first choice because I, I know a lot of people who didn't end up going into the track that they always thought they would, um, and they're they're really happy right now because they kind of roll with the punches. Even if you got a job that you loved um, with this environment right now, like there's there's no guarantees, and um, not to be a downer, but like everyone on Wall Street is, th there's very little job security right now. So if you have if you have a strong network and you've kept up with your connections and you're informed on what you're doing, uh, it just makes you that stronger candidate. Like either at your own form or elsewhere. I, I would say, uh, follow up on that, stay adaptable. I remember early in my career I worked very hard and for several months on um, some work related to uh, retirement, retirement law, policies around IRAs and so forth. And then the new tax, uh, tax code came out and it basically rendered all of it irrelevant. Um, so that's the kind of time where you might think, all right, well now I'm done for because I've associated myself with this one thing, it's now irrelevant, I'm out. And, and what helps to realize is that you're kind of the value, not, not the work. If, if you're smart enough, you can do whatever else ne needs to be done next. Um, so don't get too tied up in what you're doing. I know that's hard when you, you're in college, you're working on a paper, it's some topic you've chosen, it's yours, you own it, and you feel, you, know, you have a conviction about it. Uh, unfortunately, businesses can be, the, it can be the case where what you're doing is very important and up until the day that it's not. And then you just have to kind of put that aside, depersonalize, realize it's not about you, but for whatever reason, which you may not know, something else is a pr priority. And if you can adapt and live with that, then, then you're fine and move on. Say, uh, keep an open mind and, and don't get discouraged. Um, you know, you may not get the first thing that you want, but uh, something I see all the time is people who do a great job and maybe they outgrow that, we'll say, first position, and then you know what, they get an opportunity to move laterally within the firm to go somewhere else. I mean, I see people, uh, you know, pass other people because, all right, they did really, really great within this small group. They got, you know, accelerated to the top of the group, and the next thing you know, they're, you know, near the top of a much bigger group. Um, 
again, it, you know, maybe it's not exactly the, the spot where you want to be in, but go where they are. And then, you know what, and as time goes on, uh, you know, tables will turn. Maybe, uh, you know, M&A isn't exactly the biggest industry right now, but in a few years it may be. So just keep an open mind. If that's where you want to be, stay close. And, uh, you know, like I said, don't, don't get discouraged. I'd like to uh, tie back to one of the first things that was said during this panel, and I think it's been repeated in, in several different ways uh, throughout the discussion, which is learning. Always be learning, always be learning, always be learning. Um, you know, for whatever reason, times change. You know, your knowledge, you must continue to learn. You must be able to continue to, you know, synthesize the knowledge you've built in school, the analytical skills, um, whatever it is you specialize. Again, I specialize in healthcare finance um, to, the, you know, to the world around you, and it changes every day. And the moment that you stop learning, frankly, is the moment that it just doesn't become interesting anymore. Um, I think that probably most people in this room chose the University of Chicago because they're passionate about learning. That's why you would have come to this university. And the way to distinguish yourself um, as a candidate, the way to distinguish yourself when you're you know, in the job and you're looking for the next step forward, is to always be learning. Um, without that, just no matter what you're doing, I, I find becomes totally unfulfilling. So, I'll just say ditto. <laughs> um, I agree with what my panelists, co-panelists have said. Learning is the most important thing to me. It's why I came to the University of Chicago. It's why I continue in my career now. And as you need the adaptability, as someone pointed out, learning is a key to that. Because as the question was asked by Michael to begin with, turmoil is constant. I went through the crash of 87. I went through the crises of the early 90s. I've gone through the dot-com boom and bust of the early part of the last decade. I'm, we're going through this now. So turmoil is always part of your career in finance or in business. And adaptability and learning are, as my colleague said, are the most important things I can think of for it. One, one final comment, uh, not to be doom and gloom. I, I don't think the, the, the outlook is good for the next couple of years, but what do I know? I'm, I'm pro <laughs> the, that probably means it is, because I'm usually not a very good uh, forecaster. But the, the, well, the point is that um, as long as you're building the skills that are necessary to be successful in what your end goal is, so then, then don't worry about it. Um, so as you're building those skills, because they transfer. They transfer from one location to another. Tasks, tasks don't. Specific, specific things like, um, you know, there, actually there was a major here on, on Sovietology when, when I was here. Oops. So, yeah, exactly. So, you know, that is too specific. But, you know, a, you know, maybe the analytical skills you learned as studying the Soviet Union those are the things that transfer. So as long as you're, you're growing in that, and, and it's, it's very, uh, very much tied in with learning, as long as you're growing in that respect, then once the economy gets better and, and people start hiring, you're going to have the, built up the capacity that you're going to be out there and people are going to want your skills. It's a much better way of saying what I was trying to say before, just FYI, so that's good stuff. There. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to to ask the panelists. <coughs> Go ahead. Yeah, they might have looked our school and learned all the practical things, so it kind of relies on us. Um, in your guys' interviews that you've had or you give out now, what are some of the technical questions that you um, expect the candidate to know? So I'll tell you that when I uh, when I interview college students, I don't ask technical questions. I'm really looking for two things. I'm looking for passion, and I'm looking for poise. Um, particularly in the investment banking department of the financial services industry broadly, at the age of 22, 23, you will almost immediately be placed in front of uh, board members, uh, executives, people who uh, you know, hire us. And we have to have utter and total confidence that you, know, you will act much older than you know, your actual age. Um, and passion doesn't have to necessarily even be in terms of finance. Um, just, I'm gonna look at all of the bottom, of, at the bottom of your resume, look at all the sort of hobbies, interests, and things that you know, are listed, and I'm gonna ask you questions about that. I wanna know that whatever it is, it's something you're really passionate about. And I'll actually tell you in my own experience, in my current job, when I went to interview, in a 25 minute interview, 
out of a whole day of 25 minute interviews. I spent one block, entire 25 minutes talking about, at the bottom of my, at the bottom of my resume it says I am an avid Wilco fan and I spent the entire time talking about you know indie bands. And <laughs> when I ran into that managing director again a year later, he's a different office, we were still talking about um, indie music. That was a memorable thing for him and it certainly, I would imagine, helped. Um, so. I'd say uh, two things I look for are, are one, does your story fit? And then two, does it check out? Um, you know, I guess one, like I said, does it make sense that, okay, yes, here's, here's where your path has led you, uh, here's where your path has led you to, and this is where uh, you will do well. And then two, are you telling me the truth or are you, are you full of it? Um, I also agree that I, I don't like to ask uh, technical questions of kids just coming out of school because, quite frankly, they're just memorizing something that they read in a book anyway. Uh, that being said, not everyone is, 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 uh, is like me, and some people do. But uh, you know, in those situations, I think if you can just prove that you have just a, a high-level understanding of, of what it actually is. So like, you don't need to know every little calculation in, in whatever, in accounting or analysis, whatever. But if you just have a general idea of, of you know, whatever, how like, a cash flow statement works, you know, it, just, it shows some interest and it shows that, okay, you can get the, the fundamentals of it. But you know, like I said, I, I'd be less focused on that and just, um, and just really uh, telling your story the way it, it actually is. Yeah, we, we also don't ask those kinds of questions of people that kind of got you, you know, do you know X or Y? Uh, we might ask people what they read. And, and there, the clue I'll give you is don't say what you want the person to hear. Oh, we, I read all the books written by people at your firm, or I, I read Warren Buffett because that's an investing book, and, and you know, that you're an investment firm. Really, that's just a clue to, to see if you're interested in the world and to follow your thinking. Okay, why do you read books about Formula One racing? Uh, you know, what interests you about that? Why that rather than NASCAR? I, and that's what I'm going to ask. I'm not, I'm not really looking for you to, to sort of n understand if you know the business, because you, you couldn't. You're just coming into it. You're not supposed to be expert in it already. Uh, but you are looking for a pattern of thought and interest. So I'd, I'd have an answer to that that's not a flattering answer, because that usually comes across as BS uh, pretty quickly. Just an answer that's true to you. It's a book you actually read or you actually care about the topic. and that is more impressive. Uh, so I, I'm just remembering like some interviews that I had. And let me tell you about one. Um, I was with, it was for Merrill Lynch Investment Banking with a former like army general <laughs> and myself. And then the, he was playing bad cop and this other like younger guy, probably like a guy just out of MBA was playing good cop. And they just tore me apart. like. I left that interview. I, I, he asked me how I would analyze a company, and I was supposed to say I would do a discounted cash flow analysis. I don't know what I said, but I know I didn't say that. I was babbling about some like marketing thing. Um, so, so I would be prepared for basic questions. Um, definitely, you should. Um, I'm also remembering about a debt capital markets interview that I had with Bank of America that I didn't even know what debt capital markets was. <laughs> so, so be prepared. Um, for sure. And then I actually, I, since I don't do, I'm, like I'm not in investment banking anymore, so I did ask a couple of my friends because I had a feeling this question would come up. Uh, for the most part, I, I think like Michael was saying, um, it's, it is behavioral, it is fit, but I would be prepared for those random oddball questions that you get, like how many ping pong balls will fit in this room? Um, because you just have no idea who's gonna be interviewing you, and if you have a way to think through it, you're gonna come out that much better. Like, they don't really care about the answer. They just care about how you think and how you get there. Uh, yeah, um, uh, there's, a, there's a website, Wall, wallstreetoasis.com, where um, they actually have a lot of these questions, and, 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 and people like you will go and talk about, you know, I was in this interview, I was asked this question. So if you want a source for these kind of technical questions, that's, that's a good place that you can look. Um, first of all, you, when you, the way that you s talked about your liberal arts education is completely wrong. That is one of your assets, okay? You need to relish that and you, you, that puts you ahead of the competition. The guys that, that went and just majored in business in college, okay? They have, they have a plateau here. Liberal arts you have here, okay? So you don't, don't treat it as a negative going into an interview. It's a positive, it's one of your selling points. Um, I don't generally ask technical questions 
Um, but what I like to do is I like to figure out how people think. And I will use information that you provide me in your resume and cover letter to try to get at that. So if you say that you're an expert on derivative pricing, then I'm going to ask you a technical question to see if you are and find out. That, for me, that's a good example to find out how you think because it's a topic that you know about. If I stump you, first of all, if someone asks you about debt, whatever it is, and you don't know anything about it, don't just say, I don't know. That's the best answer you can give there. Don't try to ramble on about something. You know, because th that, that's a poor question. If they're trying to stump you, that's not where you want to go. They're probably trying to give you something which will expand your thoughts and make you sort of, sort of t uh, extrapolate and use your analytical skills. So, um, um, so be careful of that trap. But again, so the, the moral is that in, in your resume and cover letter, you should put in things there that you feel will um, lead to good questions that will highlight what you're good at. So if you really have a passion for or did a, wrote a paper on you know, the, uh, the debt crisis in Europe and you feel that you can talk sensibly about that, then add a hook in your resume that's you know, that under research or whatever you know, wrote this, you know, to analyze the debt crisis in Europe. I guarantee you'll get a question about that in an interview. And, and that will be a good way in a controlled environment in which you are able to frame the debate and talk about how well you can, uh, you can think. Yeah, plus, they're going to teach you everything that you need to know when you get there. I mean, you'll sit through like a three-month training program if you go to a bulge bracket firm. And if you go boutique, you'll, I mean, you'll, you'll learn a little quicker. But they're just seeing how smart you are. And, if they want to sit next to you for 20 hours a day. <laughs> <That's pretty much laughs> and then ride the subway home, right? <laughs> oh, 20 hours on a bad day. Probably. Okay, okay. Not on weekends, though, right? Sometimes. It's only 12. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> only we have, in deal season. Do we have one final question? Yes. For those of you that have um, experience in options trading, trading um, how do you compare um, an entry-level firm and a prop trading firm versus I'm out. I'm gonna sit this one out. I can't. I can't make that comparison. I traded on the floor of the options exchange and never went beyond that. So, well, I was in sales and trading in Goldman Sachs and worked for a small proprietary options trading firm. So perhaps maybe I should answer that one, Larry. Um, they're they're pretty much the same. Um, a lot of people start out in proprietary trading firms and then go to um, the larger uh, firms. So um, I personally like smaller firms. I think you can, you can um, get your, your hands wet and you can be very closer to the action. Um, the difference might be in, in a sales and trading role, um, less, there's a more emphasis on communication skills because there's a customer aspect to it. So if you're, if, if, so, so a prop, if, you're, if you like the numbers, you like the, the quant side of it and the excitement of the markets, but you really don't want to deal with, with people, or, or not deal with people, but you, you don't want to worry about the customer side of things, or you don't have that skill. I didn't have that skill, so I was, I was more focused on the proprietary trading side. Um, then the, the well-roundedness of the, the sales and trading role, if, if that's what you're good at, might be, might be more appealing. Another way to say that is, you know, ask yourself if you want to wear a suit every day or if you'd prefer to, uh, No one know. wears suits anymore. No one oh, wears suits Well, anymore. I'm definitely, Just definitely going to the bankers do. Yeah. 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 That's not um, sales. Well, if they go see customers, they do, they do wear suits. Our best so. bankers always wear them and ties. <laughs> Traders do not. Yeah, it's a good way. You want to be in blue jeans and gym shoes. That's, well, you, you can't wear that in, yeah, in, in sales and training, but you, you're right. You can wear that. Um, in my trading floor, people wear shorts, even in the wintertime. I mean, so you can, you can wear, wear whatever you want. Wear whatever you want. Is, so. All right. I want to thank the panelists for donating their Saturday and coming to speak with us. So thank you very much. <laughs>